Hi, I'm Kyle, one of the metal techs here at the South London Makerspace, and today we're going to talk about how to use the Safely to MIG welder. So we're going to discuss safe clothing, uh, the equipment, uh, the safety equipment and preparations around that, uh, the risk to those with pacemakers, uh, the shielding gas, and why it's important you not leave it uh, connected overnight, uh, what you could, can, should, mustn't weld, that's a fun one, uh, safety around heat and touching things and, and using uh, electricity in, in the space, uh, the welder and basic operation, uh, how to prepare surfaces like grinding, um, setting up extraction correctly, adjusting welding masks to the proper setting, changing the settings of the welder to the correct uh, for the materials uh, that you're joining, uh, troubleshooting tips and, and how it should sound, uh, as well as how to assemble things, to tack things together first, and then finally lay the together to bring it together and cleaning up the area. So first we'll go over the risk assessment, which you can find on the website and review all the things that we talked about today. If you have any questions about what's correct or not correct, uh, you can find the resources there to make sure you do this all safely. So the first we'll talk about is the largest risk in welding, which is exposure to UV. So as the welder creates this arc, the electricity travels uh, from uh, either the electrode in pig welding or here in MIG welding uh, through the wire itself from the gun, uh, creates an electrical arc which uh, creates a lot of UV. So a lot of our protections are around uh, saving both yourself as well as, uh, those, as well as those around you uh, from UV. So the first thing that we do is we wear uh, protective clothing. So you can see I'm wearing um, sleeves. Uh, I'll be wearing gloves over my hands. Uh, the mask will cover my face. And I'm not using a thin material, like a thin cotton or thing like that, that the UV can just penetrate through. So um, both my eyes, my body will be protected. Around, uh, I've set up the welding curtain, uh, which will demonstrate uh, <laughs> in just a, in a moment, uh, to make sure that uh, everyone that is within the welding curtain is protected, similar to me. So wearing the mask at all times uh, while welding is occurring, as well as protective clothing. And those outside are protected from the UV. Uh, another important risk uh, from using the welder is, the expo uh, is exposure to fumes. So uh, we will always run local extraction with this device, um, which takes the welding fumes um, that we're welding. Um, and uh, by, by having it very close to the local extraction, all the fumes that are generated will travel through this hose and be extracted away. I'm gonna make sure as I'm welding that I am not directly over the weld. So any fumes that may not be extracted uh, don't travel directly to my face. Another risk in welding is that of electrical shock. It's not a very common occurrence, um, but there are certain circumstances that uh, can cause that to happen, so we wanna be conscientious of those things. So we wanna make sure that all the equipment, the cables and all this are not pinched or uh, exposed insulation. We wanna just do a visual check to make sure that the equipment um, is not exposing us that way. We wanna make sure that the area around is not uh, damp or wet or we're wearing wet clothing or we're doing something outside. We want to make sure that the path from the arc uh, through the work material, through the base, uh, to the electrode uh, is where all the electricity flows. So uh, we're avoiding damp things uh, around uh, the space there. Another risk from welding is burning yourself. So as you can imagine, melting steel uh, is quite hot. So the work after we've welded a piece will remain warm, even if it's not visually distinct, it will remain warm for quite some time. So we wanna make sure that we're maintaining, we're using our gloves, uh, we're not touching the metal until it's fully cooled. Uh, a big risk to the space in general is uh, catching things on fire. So again, very hot uh, welds. Uh, we wanna make sure that any um, sparks or slag is bits of, um, molten uh, metal or other inclusions of things like that can pop or, or um, splatter or go different directions. We wanna make sure that the area is clean uh, of any you know, dirty rags, oil, puddles of different materials. We wanna make sure that there's you know, nothing hanging around that will catch on fire in our, in our immediate area. Uh, there is a risk of falling objects. So as we're welding something large, we wanna make sure that it's here on the table or something small and dense, it's not gonna fall, on, you know, fall on someone's foot or something like that. And we wanna make sure that all uh, cables and um, the area around where we might have to move while we're in the middle of um, the process here isn't gonna cause us to trip or fall or things like that. So we wanna make sure that it's a very, very clean area there. Um, we're going to, as we're welding, 
make sure that we don't use any enclosed containers or drums or uh, anything like that that um, could explode. So given the, the rapid ex uh, heat that we're injecting or the large amount of heat we're injecting into these containers very quickly could cause them to explode, especially if they're secondhand containers or you might think there was a particular material inside of that that uh, was actually used, some, some kind of oil or things like that. So um, especially not secondhand containers, but no enclosed boxes or, or, or things like that can be welded in this space. Um, if you have a pacemaker, make sure that you talk to uh, your doctor uh, to make sure that welding is an advisable activity. Uh, it's mostly safe these days, but certainly consult your physician before welding. Uh, additionally, we want to make sure that we treat the gas cylinders uh, quite well. We'll, we'll uh, show you a little closer there. There is a potential if things are being moved around. They should be chained to the cart at all times so they can't tip. Um, the tops of these containers, while the container itself is steel, the tops are made out of very soft brass that if they are hit and when they fall, can cause them to go uh, you know, off like a rocket. So we want to avoid doing that. Uh, it's important to wear appropriate clothing while welding. So you should not wear any synthetic materials as they can catch fire and melt and cause severe injury. So I'm wearing um, cotton here. I'm wearing jeans, closed toed shoes, uh, any hair that might be too long. I've tied back, not an issue for me, as well as uh, any strings or jewelry or things like that. Uh, there's nothing that's going to get in, uh, in the way or catch fire while I'm welding. It's also advisable to wear a welding apron such as this, um, which is just made out of leather and will make sure that any sparks that fly uh, don't catch the clothing on fire. And you'll notice that it doesn't have any front pockets that might catch sparks or slag as well. Um, so this is advisable. Uh, it's important while you're welding to wear welding gauntlets. It's recommended that you both you wear them for both hands. Some people find that when they're manipul manipulating the MIG torch um, with the gloved hand, it can be harder. Um, so it's it's not strictly required that that your your uh, leading hand that's holding uh, the torch be gloved. But I definitely recommend using both gloves as a beginner um, to operate in a safe manner. It's important to know what materials you're allowed to weld in the space. So we run primarily mild steel uh, welding wire. Um, and we can, if you're looking at other things, we can look at swapping that out for different things. But most of your beginning tasks uh, as a welder will all be accomplished using mild steel wire. Um, as far as the materials that you're joining, mild steel is one of the easiest. You're allowed to, um, for example, uh, weld steel in the space. But what you're not allowed to do is weld uh, galvanized steel. Um, which is, uh, if you're not sure of a material, it's important that you ask a metal tech to identify the material. Um, galvanized steel is usually recognized by a crinkly pattern on its surface. Um, so it's a passivization layer that can be removed from via grinding um, before you weld. Other things that are not allowed include lead, graphite, cadmium, chrome, mercury, or beryllium. Make sure that you allow 30 minutes uh, for your work to cool down as well as the surrounding area to ensure that nothing's caught on fire. And additionally, you must always have a Class C rated fire extinguisher nearby in case something does in fact catch on fire. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do uh, to weld is we're going to tag in with our uh, tool control. So you can see contacted, the green light has gone on. Next, I'm going to turn this contactor on as well as the extraction here. Now, this extraction is connected to this device here. So I want to make sure that I open it. So you can see that there is uh, a slot that goes through it, and you want to make sure that the slot is in line with the flow of the pipe so we know that that's open. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to ensure that the main extraction is on. So there's a toggle switch here as well as a knob, a pot potentiometer to turn. So here, I'm going to turn the system on. You can see it's at zero now. I'm going to turn the system on. It's coming up in this number. 
will go from 0 to 9 and then F. So we want to make sure that that is turned all the way clockwise to F as opposed to down to example for uh, 7. So clockwise all the way up to F for full. Now I've tool control in. I've got extraction going. I've opened the valve. I've uh, set the main ventilation to full. Then I'm able to turn the welder on. The main controls of the welder include two voltage selectors, where the second one, which sets the main setting, zero being all the way off, one being low voltage, two being high voltage, and then a secondary selector within uh, that one or two range to set it. Next, we want to make sure that the uh, spot time, which would allow us to spot weld for just a certain amount of time where you pull the trigger and the machine will engage for uh, a certain amount of time to complete consistent small welds. We want to make sure that's all the way down here at the bottom uh, to continuous mode. And next we want to set the wire speed. And the wire speed is how quickly it's going to feed wire through the gun and also sets our amperage. So we found that short of about four and a half the machine is especially slow and there's a very large threshold from four and a half and above. So for most things you want to be above that range um, but you will um, figure out a, a consistent setting for the material thickness um, that you're working on at the time. So we also want to make sure that this torch and spool uh, is set to torch, as we don't use the spool here in the space. Next, I'm going to uh, explain how to use uh, these auto darkening welding helmets. So we're very fortunate to have um, these uh, special uh, welding helmets that uh, will sense when we're welding. So normally, um, even when we're wearing them, demonstrate how to do that. I can see through this, um, but then once the, um, once the welding actually begins, this and anyone else who's looking at the weld with the helmet, uh, it will auto darken uh, and cause it so that we can see the arc more, more effectively. Uh, so I want to explain the, some of these are um, adjustable as far as it's called the lens, uh, and some of them are just a fixed lens which is appropriate for welding. So we want to make sure that if it's an adjustable helmet like this one, we want to set it um, between uh, 11 and 13. Probably I like to keep it, it's a personal preference, I like to keep it a hair below 12, but you can adjust it in that range safely. And that's the amount of darkening. So the higher the number, the darker the lens will be, which uh, allows you to both kind of protect your eyes and not have the eye fatigue, uh, but also to uh, allow you to see the weld pool um, as you're welding, to be able to manipulate that and make sure that um, you can see what you're doing uh, in it. And this is something that's a little bit foreign before you give it a try, but once you get used to welding and understanding how you're manipulating um, the torch, advancing it and moving that weld pool through the material, being able to see is a very important part of that. So uh, these help us uh, do that safely. So there's a couple of adjustment points on this. Um, there is on the side, these, uh, if you go like normal, so loosen uh, counterclockwise, uh, tighten clockwise, um, this allows us to adjust how easily it goes up and down. Um, those you don't necessarily need to do too often, but if you find it loose or, or too tight, you can adjust it that way. And the main control is for head size here. And so the way that these work is you depress the uh, wheel, or this one's actually just uh, not a depressing. Some of them have a little snap, so you have to push in to do this. This one is just straight normal. And then uh, counterclockwise or anti-clockwise will make it larger. Clockwise will tighten. So if I put the band on my head, and then tighten it. I want a good view that when I'm looking forward and I'm looking down, I can see through the lens. Um, and we want to make sure that, yep, so I can, even if I've got a big complicated setup or things with my hand, I can do this. And I'm able to uh, put the, weld, uh, the hood down uh, and manipulate uh, my work as well. So and it stays up as well. So uh, that's how you adjust a welding helmet. So this is our shielding gas, which is a very important part of uh, welding. And especially, uh, we're using a process called metal inert gas. And it gets its name from uh, this nozzle, which is injecting a, a, a continuous flow of gas, creating a bubble around the work, which allows us to weld and join these metals without a whole large amount of oxygen, especially at a very reactive high temperature, coming in and destroying that weld from the inside, so rusting it internally. Um, this is how we, in fact, cut metal, is by using that process. So we want to exclude all the oxygen um, while we're welding to make sure that we can join those metals very, very cleanly. And so a very, very important part of that is that sh this shielding gas here. 
So we, there's different gas mixes for different kinds of welding, but for the vast majority of what happens here in the space, uh, this is the important gas mix. So uh, this is the gas regulator, which takes it from this very, very high um, pressure here inside the tank and regulates it down to what the welder itself needs. So we want to make sure that we only use this novel, this, uh, excuse me, we only use uh, this knob to adjust the flow rate of the gas, where when we're, we're shutting it on and off, we're only going to use this one. So again, I'm going to go to the left here to open it. And I cracked it a little bit at the beginning. And then, I'm, uh, I, then I can open it more quickly. Um, and then the important thing is we want to make sure that um, our flow in uh, CFM as we're actually welding. So here, I'm away from the work. Uh, I'm able to advance wire like this. There's no risk of electrocution here. So I've tapped in. And now with this main contactor, you can see it's on zero here in the down position. I'm going to flip it on. Now that's on. And I've turned the welding on here. So I want to make sure that now I've got the torch. Um, there's no risk of it creating an arc because I'm in the air here. It's um, safe to do. I can check to make sure as I release gas. So we're actually uh, a little bit low in our CFM. We want to make sure that that's um, closer to, it needs to be above 20 in what we're doing today here. So I can regulate that upwards. And then now uh, our gas flow is appropriate. So what I'll do is I'll get a little, uh, a little more in the welding mode here. OK. So you can see I'm wearing my full protective. I've got my sleeve covered. I'm good to go. Now I've got uh, the torch here. I'm going to take the welding pliers. And I can simply put this up to the nozzle and cut. And you can see uh, I've got a little bit of stick out there. Um, but in this particular case, before I begin welding, I look at this and I see the nozzle is quite a mess. So I can pop that off. And using, using the pliers here, we can see that someone was practicing and <laughs> a little close to the material. So we've got some buildup on the inside here. Um, and additionally, on the interior. We can clean that out. And we could use a little bit of more love for this tip. But uh, it is a consumable. And especially as people practice, we know that these are going to be replaced. Not to say that you should dip into the material and try and go for it. But uh, we know that this uh, is, a, is an item that eventually will need to be replaced. And we can see, looking in the interior here, it uh, looks like we're still grabbing the wire pretty close to diameter. This uh, tip will wear out. We do have spares of those. It is a consumable item for sure, but still looks to be uh, in, in not too bad condition. So I will return this. I'm going to turn this off while I'm manipulating that. All right. So now we've got all our ventilation on. We've got our gas flow going. We're in tool control. The welder is set to our appropriate settings. Now we're going to think about our actual welding process. So today, uh, as part of your project, you'll probably, unless the things changed, <laughs> be welding two plates together. So it's uh, important when we're uh, extracting gases that we talked about before that the local extraction, which is off now, but uh, you want to make sure it's on uh, while you're using it, um, is in kind of as close proximity you can. So if obviously if it's awkward angles or things like that, and um, we can remove this mount and move it if you're welding something larger, uh, we want to make sure that we're in a distance that still gives you some to, some room to work, um, but we'll extract all the gases here. So um, ideally, uh, as close as you can get without affecting the shielding gas. Um, but we don't want to be welding way out here, for example. So now that I've got uh, the ventilation all set up, tool control, the machine all set properly, I've got the tip clean and ready to go, as well as the proper stick out on it. Uh, I am ready to start thinking about how uh, I'm going to weld. So um, normally, before you do this, you'll do some surface prep on the material. And so it's important that if you want a very strong joint, 
uh, that you want to uh, make sure that you grind all the surfaces clean. We want to make sure there's no paint or other things that might volatilize uh, and become either noxious gases or um, potentially inclusions within that weld. Um, and so what we're going to do today is just called a simple butt joint. So you, uh, your instructor will take you through this, running some beads, some practice beads along the material before uh, doing a joint together. But just to show the theory of it, um, what I'm going to do um, is what's called tack welding first. So as you build larger things, it becomes more critical that you have things that, you know, you have jigs that hold things in place. Uh, but you want to m make sure that it's all exactly as you want it before you uh, apply these main beads. Because as the metal warms, uh, the metal itself will twist and bend and expand. But additionally, um, the, the weld that you lay has a tendency to shrink as it cools, like many things. And so if you start on one corner and just weld a bead straight across, um, what you'll find is that, that, that shrinking, especially if it's at a 90 degree or trying to keep things there, that shrinking will cause uh, the material to not be as you laid it out. So what we do is we apply small little welds um, across, you know, in this corner first and then this corner, and then apply the main bead there. So uh, I'm going to demonstrate that for you. Uh, an important thing before that is um, talking about technique in how we weld. And so we want to make sure that this gas bubble that we're creating here, if we hold the torch down like this, that's just going to get blown out and, and not be very good um, at keeping uh, our weld uh, from oxidizing. So we want to make sure that we hold it, not at a vertical angle, but probably about 20 degrees off uh, is a good angle here. We want to make sure that we're not welding way out here or right here. When we're looking at our pool, we'll see exactly how it works, or you'll get kind of used to uh, exactly how to manipulate the pool and, and make that happen. But we want to make sure that we're not down and having our nozzle touching the, you know, um, in the weld pool or engaging that. We want to come off the metal a little bit. We want to be at a, a 20 degree angle off a of vertical. And then we want to choose to either push this weld or we want to pull this weld. So you'll get used to um, one way or the other. People naturally. Um, kind of prefer, they think they prefer to pull, but honestly, for beginners, um, it's quite often to do a better weld pushing. Um, so kind of, you can try both of them out, get a feel for one or the other. And what we want to do is, as we're welding, the, the main focus of what we're doing is manipulating what's called the weld pool, which you'll see it um, through, through the visor when you're welding yourself, but it's this molten area of metal that we are going to advance the torch through. So. Some people like to do C's. Some people like to just um, kind of rock back and forth. There's lots of different techniques to be able to kind of ad slowly advance this weld pool uh, through the weld. And we'll see that when we're putting in the right amount of heat, we're getting good, it's, uh, it's, got, it's called good penetration. We want to make sure that weld is not just on the surface. It doesn't just sit on top of the metal. We want to make sure that we are joining as deeply as, as possible both of these materials without burning through. Um, and so looking at the back side of our welds is going to be a good indicator of how well we, we penetrate through there, um, as well as, as um, destructively testing them um, to see if, if we did what we really set out to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, tack weld this first, show you what that looks like, and then uh, we'll go in and, and lay down a butt joint. Actually, I don't think I'm going to film the butt joint because it might destroy my camera, but <laughs> we'll show the result. <laughs> so now you can see after adjusting the settings and getting things proper, we've got two little spot welds here, which don't have a lot of penetration. You can see through the gap there that uh, it's just the line, um, but that allows us to, it's actually pretty strong. It'll allow us to um, weld the full bead. Uh, without uh, it m m moving or, or growing or shrinking in different places. And especially if we wanted a very, very um, uh, dimensional uh, weld, we would tack on one side and weld the other, and that would keep us from uh, pulling this uh, together as it cools. Uh, in this case, what I'll do is just tack, though, and then weld that same bead there. So I'll do that next. All right, so I've demonstrated uh, two different techniques and two little bits here. Uh, so you can see at the bottom, this is where I used a, uh, a push style. Um, and so I was able to create a, a wider bead here. You can see that the angle at which the, the, it's called the roots of the weld on the side, although I didn't weld so straight as I figured out where my line was, um, 
you can see that the roots of the weld are not vertical. Um, it's able to blend uh, at a lower angle. So I'm able to build that weld pool and slowly advance it. Um, you can see a very distinct uh, pattern of as I was rocking back and forth, but not a lot of uh, very like inconsistent skinny fat, that sort of thing. Um, and so we have a very wide, uh, low roots, good uh, material there. And I've demonstrated um, kind of a, a pulling weld here from the top downwards. So I, I welded it in this position here. Um, and you can see I've demonstrated what it looks like when you have um, kind of uh, varying thicknesses. You can see I wasn't regulating uh, the speed at which I was welding very well. I've got kind of skinnier sections, fatter sections there. The roots of the weld are quite vertical, which means um, I probably have pretty low penetration. So if we were to cut through this, um, we'd see that not a lot of the base material was engaged in the weld there. Uh, and also demonstrated um, the ability to stop and start. So a beautiful thing about MIG welding as opposed to stick welding is there's not any material we need to chip any off or anything like this. We can take multiple passes. A little bit of cleaning. Um, as you can see, there are some inclusions from torch angle here. Uh, would probably be prudent. Just brush it off with a wire brush. Um, but we're able to lay another bead right next to it or practice or do things like that um, without too much trouble. So that's one of the, the great parts of, of MIG welding. Uh, so it's a little hard to tell in the video, um, but you can see a little bit of the heat effect zone on the back side. So I didn't get the full penetration. Let me see if one of the earlier examples, um, I think we had some really good ones uh, Luke and I had done for the first demonstration. I guess this is uh, starting to see a little bit harder as time wears on. Um, but we have a nice thick weld bead here that's been done. Um, the consistency is, is, is pretty good. And especially right when it's hot, we can start to see the heat that has come through in this heat effect zone of the material. And that means that although you can kind of, you know, if you start seeing it from the sides, it's a little bit harder because it's hard to get penetration on there without blowout on the corner. Um, we can see that the, the metal um, was quite warm and we had, we had penetrated, if we were to break this apart and destructively test it, um, through, through there without making it too embrittled. So uh, that's a, a good example there. All right, we'll say, uh, after all done uh, and clean, we want to make sure that we're um, licking and, and making sure there's no fire, nothing on fire there, or different parts or sparks that we've sent uh, around to different places. And we're going to watch for about 30 minutes. We're going to stay in the space and make sure that uh, nothing catches on fire before we head out. So after we're done welding, it's really important uh, to leave the space just as clean uh, for the next person, if not cleaner. So you want to make sure that the countertop is completely clean. All the tools have been put back in the appropriate places and we'll follow the exact same procedure to turn everything off. So we will turn the welder off. We will ensure that we have turned off the shielding gas as the shielding gas uh, when left overnight uh, will um, fit, will leak through the fitting and will empty the cylinder. So it's super, super critical that when we're done welding, and what we want to do is we're going to turn this off. Uh, we're going to close this valve. And then when we get towards the end, we want to make sure and not slam it closed. We're going to be gentle on it there. We're going to turn the contactor off. We're going to sign out of tool control. We're going to turn extraction off here. Close the valve that we had previously opened and set this back to off. And uh, after we clean our, our top and make it perfectly clean, put everything back, we'll be done.